Hello, everyone. Can you hear me? No one will be able to tell me, so I guess I'm just going to go for it. Hi, thank you so much for coming today. My name is Erin Williams. I'm the executive director of the Muncie Arts and Culture Council. And Ply Space is a program of the Muncie Arts and Culture Council. And we are so excited this fall to have been able to host Natan Diacon Furtado. He has been a fantastic resident and has been working with the Ball State University School of Art Foundation Department um, throughout this fall and doing this fantastic project called Our Patterns. So tonight he is going to talk a little bit about his work since we couldn't do the traditional artist talk and have Natan in one of the rooms at Ball State, we are doing our very first virtual experience. So we're excited to try this too. So good luck to all of us. So tonight what we're gonna be doing is let Natan speak a little bit. He's gonna show us a video. And then afterward, we're gonna have a question and answer session. So if you're interested in participating in the question and answer session, all you need to do is type your questions into the, the question and answer box at the bottom of Zoom. If you're watching from Zoom, if you're not watching from Zoom, I'm sorry, you can't participate in our question and answer session, but hopefully you will get your questions answered because we have a number of prepared questions as well. So we should be able to get everything covered. If you do have other questions that pop up and you're really excited about Natan's work, feel free to pop over to our website at www.plyspace.org. If you go to residents, you will see Natan right there on our residents page. So I guess with that, we will get the party started. It's 6.04, so let's see what happens. So if anybody has any questions, Anything crazy is going on on your end? I guess call me and I'll be here. And in the meantime, here's the time. So I'm gonna pass it over to you. Wow, thanks Aaron. Thanks Rachel. Uh, I'm just so happy to be here. I think it's super cool that, you know, even throughout all these various crises, we're getting to do this and come together. And I think it's, it's a really nice that we figured out a way to do this that kind of vibes with how, uh, um, the whole project has unfolded. You know, I think we've really figured out a cool way uh, with uh, our collaborative projects here with Ply Space and Ball State to create sort of a community that is initiated online and is happening online, but the energy sort of manifests out into the real world. And I, I think, you know, I hope the video shows a little bit of that thought process and I hope we can talk a little bit more about that. And we I would be remiss in saying that, you know, the Our Patterns Muncie project that I've been working on collaboratively with uh, students and faculty at the Ball State School of Art isn't over yet. Of course, you can go on the Instagram and see our amazing digital community quilt and scroll through the feed of that quilt and click in on every quilt tile and see the patterns and see the thought behind the patterns and see all of the students written comments. But we're also going to be projecting the quilts uh, in their entirety, not just at PlySpace, uh, next Thursday. Uh, I don't know what date that is. It's like the fifth, I think. Uh, and then also the Thursday after that, we'll be projecting them at uh, Ball State School of Art in the courtyard. And so I think it's a really cool moment where we're going to take our digital community and we're actually going to make it live in the real world and the physical world. So uh, keep on the lookout for that stuff. I want to just really quickly thank all of the amazing students who I've just been completely humbled by all their incredible work. And you see a lot of it behind us. I mean, it's so good that, you know, it was our choice to use it as our backgrounds today because it just has such a positive and amazing community energy to it. And, and it's, the students have just been incredible collaborators and I've just been completely humbled by their participation. So I wanna thank each and every one of you. And also uh, the faculty, um, at first, I want to thank Rachel. Rachel has just been the most amazing coordinator for all of this foundation's work. And it's just so clear how much work you do. And it's, it's amazing. And it made my life easier. And I think it's the only reason this happened. So I really, really, really appreciate you. And also all of the incredible faculty, uh, Barbara Boer, Giorgio, Kelvin Burzon, Devin Ward, and Lynn Witzel. Just, I mean, I didn't have a single bad interaction. I had multiple incredible interactions with every single one of the faculty. And I think that trickled down and exploded outwards into all the students. So I just can't thank any of you enough, really. Um, and we'll talk about this project a little bit more afterwards. But uh, what we're going to do now is instead of a regular artist talk, um, we thought it would be really cool if, if, if we sort of did a pre-recorded short documentary that's about 10 minutes long that is going to take the place of the artist talk. And then we'll come back and we'll do a Q&A that's longer. Because I like 
being able to sort of spontaneously think of things in the moment. And I thought that if we're already going to do this wild new Zoom version, we might as well go all out and try it in a couple different directions. So we're going to have this pre-recorded video, and then we're going to have the totally live off the cup Q&A, and they're both going to be considered part of the artist talk. So if that's cool with everybody, I'm just going to start that now. Um, Aaron, I haven't looked at the chat. Do we have anything that means we need to slow down? Great. Okay, here we go. Okay. Can we see that? Have we seen my screen? It's black right now. At the heart of my practice, I'm a collaborative artist and designer. I collaborate with communities, built environments, and material histories to realize projects focusing on identity creation and storytelling. As a Brazilian and an American, having grown up between the Smoky Mountains of Appalachia and the modernist city of Brasilia, I embrace a global Southern heritage of fundamental geometries and pattern making as a visual translation device for experiencing and exploring these identities and stories through printmaking, sculpture, and digital projection. I can't talk about my practice as an artist and a designer without talking about where I grew up. In the Smoky Mountains, I learned all about the art of storytelling, all about making a mountain out of a molehill and making do with the humble objects around you. As a kid in Brasilia, I got to experience firsthand what it's like to grow up in a place that didn't exist before 1950 and understand that a physical environment could be used to establish a new culture, physically crafting and curating what a modern Brazil and a modern Brazilian people would be like. My practice is also a product of my training and professional experiences in anthropology, architecture, and public interest design. As an anthropologist, I'm interested in where and how creative projects emerge out of the individual unconscious and how these projects, when they're translated into the real world, reveal, reflect, create, and change our communities and cultures. As a designer, I engage with the practice of architecture and making space with an eye towards community engagement and empowerment, coupling that with a deep curiosity in the built environment and the ways that it makes culture and identity visible and tangible. As an artist, I try to take these strands of anthropology and design and combine them to aid in the creation, discovery, and rediscovery of diverse stories, as well as the spaces in which those stories can be told. My series of collaborative projects called Our Patterns comes from a desire to apply some of the methods of anthropological fieldwork to my art as a way of exploring further within myself and the communities I'm a part of and engage with. These projects use the creation of a digital quilt of patterns as a visual translation device to better understand each of our individual patterns of exploration, working, creativity, family, tradition, and more. It's my hope that through this artwork, we can begin to build larger stories to tell ourselves, our communities, and the world about our identities and our culture. For the past three weeks, I've been working with faculty and students in the Ball State University School of Art 2D Design Fundamentals program to create our patterns Muncie. In the first week, students work to capture an instance of their subjective point of view and creative intuition on paper through the creation of two-dimensional graphic stamps based on how they observe the world around them. In the second week, we focused on learning about ourselves while progressing through the making of an artwork. The first week's stamps were turned into patterns, with each student exploring the various possible arrangements and rotations of their stamps, and what new stories these patterns told beyond the original significance of those stamps. For the final week, students were asked to lay claim to all of the conscious and unconscious work they have been doing in the creation of a final pattern piece for inclusion in the digital quilt. Working alongside these students, I found myself exploring what it felt like to be visiting Muncie for the first time and to be engaging with a culture of the Midwest that I haven't experienced before, 
even though I have family roots to the Midwest on my father's side. Keeping a visual diary is at the core of my art. It's a practice of recording my day-to-day -day existence that in the recording becomes a practice of opening myself up to the world each and every day. As a Portuguese speaker who spends every day switching between my native tongue and the languages of English, anthropology, and design, my art oftentimes acts as my translator, bridging between the spaces within myself while also reaching out into the wider world. I trust my art to reveal the outer and inner world to me. This trust lets me engage with my artistic process like it's a simple tool, a small set of shapes, rhythms, and rotations that, in their infinite possibilities for combination, act as a vessel for identity creation and storytelling. When I walk by a cracked concrete block, I only see it for a second, but its shape imprints in my memory. My hands turn that memory into a rubber stamp, a physical tool I can use to explore my attraction to that cracked block. As I ink the stamp and rotate it across the page, birds begin to appear as if they were a mirage. These are the Art Deco neon birds of the Sunset Strip where I was born, and these are also the flocks of peace doves embedded in the tiles covering the buildings of Brasilia where I grew up. As I work down the page, I instinctively reach for colors. They create another layer of rhythm and depth another story to tell. They take me back to the church at the end of my grandparents' street, the feeling of color and light washing over me, the feeling of being touched by that light. My work is most successful when it extends beyond itself in this way, when the process of making is just the starting point for learning and understanding. Though they become something highly personal along the way, I want each of my pieces to be open enough to hold space for anyone that interacts with them. In this way, each piece can act as a translation device for wherever it is placed and whoever is brought in contact with it. If our patterns is a collaboration with the anthropologist inside of me, then my sculptural work is a collaboration with my inner designer and architect, where I engage with pattern making as a spatial practice that can aid in the creation, discovery, and rediscovery of diverse stories, as well as the spaces in which those stories can be told. These infinity patterns are pop-up sculptures derived from manipulated sheets of my hand-printed patterns that each draw from my diaristic practice of daily stamp making. I craft these pieces so that they utilize light, shadow, geometry, and color to release their patterns from the confines of the page, engaging in a form of visual code switching, which I think of as a way for both the artwork and myself to gain strength through ephemerality. It's this ephemeral quality that makes each of these pieces place-specific, resulting in a constant and infinite collaboration with nature and the built environment. This constant flux comments on the code switching across multiple registers that has been a constant factor of my life as a globally Southern person of color. And it gives that switching pride of place as the locus point for my need and ability for translation, both within and outside of myself. I engage with this visual code switching as a bridge and translation device for further exploring issues of culture and identity between myself and the many communities I exist within. When working away from home, as I've been doing as the Fall 2020 Ply Space Resident Fellow, these infinity patterns allow me to start a conversation between myself and a new community. They allow me a way in. I want to keep circling around these two words, R and infinity, in the same way that they keep circling around my work. I want to enlarge their meanings and keep digging deeper, to keep exploring the connections between them, the ways you can almost find each word's meaning in the other. I want to keep finding new links in my work that take me deeper into myself and farther out into community. If my art can be anything, I want it to be a way of finding myself in community and finding community in myself. I know I'm setting up a project that doesn't end, and I wonder if that lack of an ending can be a spark in my work that reaches out to everyone that comes in contact with it. 
I want my work to hold an openness of meaning that welcomes you into it. I want that openness to act as a spark that stays with you and with me, growing and changing with each new encounter, creating a new language, a shared language. And as I say that, I remember how my grandfather learned Esperanto and was a big proponent of this new language as a bridge for all of mankind. History keeps circling. I hope that I can be a part of that circle, that my work can draw from and give to this big conversation in a way that I know so many others already have. And there you go. So that's that. Do we have, so now we're gonna go into a Q&A section. Um, and if you all have any questions, you know, feel free to throw them into the Q&A box there and, and uh, Aaron will be keeping an eye on that. I also need to really quickly, because we were talking about our patterns Muncie at the beginning, I didn't get to say my deep and immense thanks to Aaron because the Ply Space Fellowship and the whole residency has just been completely incredible. and you know, even in a time of all these pandemics to be able to have this space and this amazing energy uh, all around me to be able to create all this work and to be able to, you know, channel that out into all the students has just been completely wonderful. So thank you, Aaron. You're welcome. It was really a pleasure. And we're not done with you yet. So yeah, I'm you still have to fly away tomorrow. We're still working on some things. <laughs> so I guess to get started, um, I need to pull up my little question list here. Um, I was wondering if you can talk a little bit more about your uh, engagement with the Midwest and how has that influence um, of you being in Muncie, how has that influenced your work since you've been at Ply Space? Has it been a big influence? I know you're a world traveler, you've lived all over, you know, how does this really set, it does, or does it, does Muncie set anything apart for you in your work? That's a good question. I think that, um, I've said to a multiple people that, you know, it's funny you say that I've traveled a lot, but I've said to multiple people that this is probably the most culture shock I've gotten um, in terms of being anywhere. Uh, I think that uh, that's not a bad thing. It's been really kind of an amazing experience. As I said in the video, you know, my father's family is from here. My father's from uh, the Midwest as well. And, and I, I thought having that connection that I would be sort of prepared for it even. And, and I'm sure I'm, you know, I'm not getting the full experience because of a pandemic, but um, there's a sort of uh, matter of factness that is really opening. Um, and, and I think, you know, if you one was being derogatory, you'd call that a plainness, but there's real beauty in that. Um, it's, uh, and, and for somebody like myself, who's really interested in the complexity that you can find with just keep tugging at simplicity, I find that sort of matter of factness, not just in the people and in the culture, but in the geography and the landscape and the architecture, really fascinating, right? And so I think there's a, that's one of the big reasons why a lot of the work that I did personally as part of the Our Patterns Muncie stamps with the students on my end were a lot about how this plainness, this sort of squareness, this sort of classic modernist square make do architecture that is so prevalent here you experience it as, as a human as so much more than that, right? You experience all of its angles and its facets and it makes you really tune into your own point of view. And so I think to answer your question succinctly, which I have failed in doing, um, the biggest thing is just, is just this, this, this beautiful sort of almost divine plainness, right? Rachel, do you want to take yeah. a question? Yeah, I'm, well, I, I want to respond to that question. Yeah, kind of keep going with an off the cuff one, even though Ooh. I sent you the previous questions. But I mean, I guess as you're talking, there's such an importance of place. So, I mean, this is kind of a two part that the two parts might not connect very easily. But one was a sort of thinking about uh, you talking about these two places that are very important to your childhood upbringing. And um, I was kind of curious as to when you really became aware of some of those, that language or that visual language that you're using. I mean, was that always a part of it? Is that something you're kind of reflecting back on? Mm -hmm. um, and my second part of that question would be also about abstraction in storytelling. So you're talking a lot about telling stories about place, but um, there is a lot of abstraction 
from what you're actually observing. Yeah. So I'm kind of curious as to how you see that or how we would understand those stories. Sure. Yeah, um, that's a two great questions. Uh, to answer the first one, I think, you know, I say it a little bit in the video, but I can be more specific here, which is that growing up in Brasilia, which was literally a city that didn't exist before, you know, 1951. And my, my mother's family moved there to build it, to help build it. Um, so we, the family, you know, as a lineage was there at the onset and, and is at the creation of this, not just this city, but this new culture, Brazilian culture for the future. Um, and, and if you go to Brasilia, you'll notice that almost every single piece of architecture has patterns either tiled or stamped into concrete. Uh, work and that was a way of creating a whole new visual language for the city, right? It was like, and and modernism, a lot more in Brazil and South American, uh, Central American countries than the U.S. Modernism was really seen as this way of sort of moving past imperialism. I, US, the U.S. didn't really use it that way, but um, so in Brazil, you know, modernist architecture in Brasilia as an entirely modernist city was entirely about this, like moving past a whole era of imperialism and then creating a new. And so for me, I think these patterns and this abstraction, like you're talking about, just to get to the second question, have always been tied up in that. I think for me, I've always seen something freeing in abstraction, but it's also something when you think about like a lot of the global Southern traditions that use like uh, simplified, let's say, geometries as a way of conveying stories. Like, it's not necessarily abstraction that doesn't carry the meaning with it. It's abstraction that, that actually carries the meaning more, right? It almost signal boosts it by being simpler. And I always think about my abstractions as that in that vein. So, like, um, in a, a lot of the ways I think of, like, getting to, like, the well, let's go back to the plainness of the Midwest, right? This sort of divine plainness. I think about getting to this, like, this little kernel of simplicity that allows maybe not, you might not be able to say like, oh, that stamp is about Natan having seen this one building at 255 on Wednesday, but this sort of feeling of openness and plainness and of like encountering this mass that turns into a diagonal that comes through, I think, as sort of like a energy. Um, so yeah, if that answers your question. Yeah, I mean, it also made me think a lot about um, confidence and your confidence, um, that I think comes through in, in the way that you work and also intuition. Um, so I guess that's something that as I've been watching you work, I mean, it's been really uh, awesome to attend the live Instagram sessions and just kind of chill out and watch you uh, working on your process. But uh, in that, there's a lot of, you know, you have a very open intuitive process. So at what point do you kind of judge failure or success working in that kind of open way? Yeah. I really love that question because, and I'm going to give a question that's, I'm going to give an answer that is not in any way a cop-out. I want you to know that. But uh, I really don't think I even have a framework for judging that. And I almost, I, I would almost push back on that question and say, like, I don't even think it's up to me to judge whether it fails or it succeeds. Like, the way I'm working is really just about how it feels internally to me, but it's not about failure or or success, it's about calmness or like you need to keep going. So like oftentimes when I'm working on something, I'll know when to finish because I'll just get this sort of like calm sense within me. And that's a lot ties into the whole intuitive practice thing. Um, it's just sort of like the, my entire body just says like, it's all good, no problem. Or like I'll feel a sort of tugging that moves it in a, in a direction, whether that's a change in material or that's like adding a gesture or something. Uh, but I don't think that there's a thought about uh, failure or success. And I actually really like the concept that that's on the person who's interacting with the piece at whatever time they interact with it. Like, I don't need the piece to be a failure or a success globally. I want it to be a failure or a success, like, locally at each person's mind. Yeah. I mean, I know I we sort of talked about in the video that one moment where you have, like, that fourth stamp where I'm like, is he going to go for it? And it's like it's running out of ink. And I'm like, ah, you know, and I think that, that that's, like, actually a moment that really, to me, reveals a lot about your practice, that kind of willingness to just go for it, mm -hmm. you know, and, and you know, that, that fear that I have that there's not going to be enough ink, but the beauty that kind of came from that and your confidence, that's, that's what I guess, what I mean by the confidence yeah. that I see in the yeah. work. I think, I mean, I, 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 first off, thank you, because that's a huge compliment, and I just want to accept that and say thank you, but also I think that in my mind, I think of that as just being open to whatever is going on, right, so like the going for the fourth, like, dab of the stamp without re-inking it, to me, is all about, like, 
not just my mind being like blank and me just working, but also like there's something so beautiful about how different sort of like the different energies of my hand go in when the ink is gone, right? So like there's something, now that I've sort of intuitively worked with stamps for a while, I, I know like the ink isn't totally gone because I don't push on the stamp the same way each time, right? So in a lot of ways, when I push past when there should be no more ink left, it's because I'm really interested in seeing like, well, now I get to find out where it is on this stamp that I don't push a lot, you know? So it's like always this sense of discovery. So, so I'm humbly accepting the compliment, but I'm reframing it as openness and discovery. Cool. If I can jump in real quick, this kind of is a great transition to a couple questions we have from the audience. Awesome. Um, one is just a really simple question about some of your materials that you use, such as what is your favorite material for carving blocks? How does that mm. process work? What yeah. kinds of inks and colors are you using? Things like that. Yeah. And then I have another bigger question, but I'll ask that next. Totally. Uh, you know, I, I love answering this question, but I feel like it's always an unsatisfying answer, which is just like, I just, for color, it's just like, I go online or I go to the art store and like a color catches my eye and I buy it. And, uh, so like, you know, I have, uh, I mean, we always have to have blues and yellows cause I really favor those, uh, colors. But other than that, like, it's really whatever comes with it. And sometimes, you know, I'll surprise myself by just getting a, like a wacky pack of colors and going from that, like, it's all about having like, you know, maybe there's a better way to answer this, which is just saying color and material selection is all about having like certain things that I'm always drawn to, and then sprinkling in things that I'm not always drawn to and just seeing where they show up, because it's it's kind of a way of inviting that playfulness and that chance into the practice at my table, right? Sure. Um, and then in terms of cutting stamps, I mean, I, let me grab a piece here, but, you know, just basic old, basic old rubber you know, we'll do you. Um, but again, it gets to your hands, right? So like if you use a, and this is maybe in the weeds, but it'll be cool for people maybe. You know, if you use a quarter inch stamp here, you know, I'm really gonna be able to press this whole thing down pretty easily. So I'm not gonna get the same kind of like motion of, of, of force that, that's kind of like more fluid across the stamp and might look kind of interesting. So sometimes I'll use, you know, like something a lot thicker, right? because like, I can't, I don't know where the force is gonna, I don't know how the force transfers, right? So that's kind of a fun way to put chance into it too. It's like, I just don't know. So again, it's all about just having some things you're used to and some things you're not used to. Yeah, that's interesting. I didn't think about it that way, but just giving yourself, ooh, giving yourself a chance to kind of either make a mistake or just make a happy accident is really yeah. part of the process. Exactly. Um, I have a, a longer question. I'm going to read it. It's from Greg, and it says, so it's, it's going to, we're going to get meta here. It's going to get deep. It says, you talked a bit about your relationship between your diary practice and your work, and we heard a fair amount about the way that your infinity patterns are interacting with space and place. How do your patterns interact and emerge from you out of time? Mm. How, how do your patterns interact and emerge for you out of time? Do you see yourself structuring your days and your work in analogous patterns? Do you perceive yourself as operating within patterns on a broader time scale or exerting your own patterns on time? So taking us off the paper, now awesome. we're getting into space and time. So first off, I have to say hi to Greg because Greg is literally my oldest friend. Well, he is getting uh, So what's up, Greg? <laughs> Um, great question. Um, yeah, no, exactly. Uh, I think I even say it as the, um, it's not a public piece of, of, of any, a document you can download, but in the um, intro PDF for the class for our Patterns Muncie, I think I said, you know, one of the goals of this project is that through these visual patterns, we'll also get to dig into each of our own patterns of sort of like existence, our patterns of communing, our patterns of working, faith, um, all these different patterns that make up our day to day. And so like, I'm really conscious about all of these sort of like building blocks that form, you know, patterns to our life. Um, and I would say that, um, how do I say this? I think that the patterns kind of swirl around a lot of the time, right? So like, I'll go through days where I won't actually make work out of any stamps, but a lot of stamps will show up, you know, and I'll keep track of them and I'll, I'll and then, and then I'll go back and, and, and 
sort of assess what I've done over the course of a couple of days. And that's when work or ideas will start to come. So there's, there's always this pattern. It's sort of cyclical in my practice and in my life where I'll, it, it's almost like thinking about sort of like primary material and then like the secondary actually working with that material. Like I'll have days or weeks where I'm actually just sort of collecting primary material, like literally just letting these stamps come out. Um, and then I might go a month just working with one stamp, right? So there's this sort of cyclical nature to it. So, yeah. Thanks, Greg. Wait, can I, I'll ask one from the chat also. This is from Barb, but um, it's about scale. So uh, that's something that we've also seen you kind of playing around with on this residency with you know, some of the smaller works and then kind of maybe how you envision your larger work. But she's also asking here um, about how you think the size and scale will change the students' patterns when we project them. Yeah, we were talking about this a little bit in some of the classes on Zoom, you know, I think it changes everything. I think in a really good way, it's completely, it's a singular experience to, to what we have now, I think, to like, with this digital to physical divide to be able to like meet your art for the first time in reality, you know? And so I think that it's not just the scale, but it's the actual physical, even though it's light, there's a physical nature to it when we're projecting it that I think a lot of students and I personally don't think I'm like fully prepared for. I think it's gonna be quite emotional. Um, so I really think that that changes everything because I, I think not just because you're experiencing it as a big projected pattern, but because all of the intentions and the thoughts and the creative energy that you've put into your piece, all of a sudden they're real and the light sort of is emitting it, you know, it's hitting this wall, but it's not just ending at the wall, it's like shining back on you. So it's, it's really, I think it's a whole new ball game and I'm just, I'm super excited to be there when it happens. It almost takes it to a sculptural realm in a yeah. way, because mm -hmm. it's, it's interacting with your space around you instead of just in front of your screen. Oh, a hundred percent. And that's why, you know, I think I, I might just jump to a question that I saw in, in your all's amazing prepared questions list to just answer this, which is to say that that's what I love about the fact that we're going to be doing two different projections plus the online Instagram feed of this thing is they're really three totally different works in a lot of ways, right? They're going to be the original work is the feed, but I love the fact that we can remix and reuse our, our art to create these completely different things. And they are, they're going to be light sculptures. Yeah. Yeah. I have another question here from the Q and A. Um, this is from Devin Ward, hey, and uh, he says hello. He was one of your faculty that you worked with up at Ball State, so we're really happy that he was able to participate in this project. And he's curious about um, your larger scale patterns, since they take a lot of time. He says potentially hours and hours of repetitive action. Does this process lead to something like meditative or ruminative practice for you? And um, how does this practice differ from other aspects of your practice? Mm, that's a great question. Um, yes, I mean, the, it's an emphatic yes answer, right? Um, I will put on music or put on uh, something in the background and just sort of go. And, and, you know, some of the sculptures that we made for the Infinity Patterns uh, exhibition at Flyspace those were made out of like six or seven or eight, like, you know, big two foot by three foot sheets of paper that are, are, are stamped not on one side, but on both sides and then hand cut out um, and then hand folded and then, and then mount assembled. So they take a long time, but the, I, I think in a lot of ways, I've almost devised the practice around it taking that long because I really love that sense of just working down the page without exactly knowing where I'm going. And it's, it, and, and I think if anything, those larger pieces actually have the most of that sort of like just sort of journeying energy in them. And it, oftentimes that's when I have thoughts about like where, what the shapes of the sculptural pieces will be, right? So in a lot of times, as I'm saying, there's this sort of cyclical nature of like first the primary material shows up and then the actual work show up and how to make them. A lot of times it's in the actual stamping that I will think like, oh, this would be really cool if we assembled it this way, or this would be really cool if we assembled it this way. And also, as I said in the video, you know, there's something amazing about getting into a stamp and, and trying a different rotation or doing a different pattern. And then all of a sudden in the negative space, um, something totally new shows up, right? And a lot of the times that'll trigger memories and I'll get to like reminisce or I'll get to have, think about like, or, you know, in the example in the video is I, I have this stamp that the first time I used it, I realized it was both this sort of desert bird 
and it was the doves that are always on the tiles in Brasilia. And so to be able to think about sort of this connection between where I was born and then a lot of the places where I grew up um, and to have that in my practice just through the sort of physical work, a sort of almost monotonous uh, uh, work is really amazing. So yeah, exactly. It's like that. Rachel, do you want to pull from, from our list? Sure. I was like, there's so many good ones to ask that I'm not I sure. Um, I mean, I guess let's go with one about language. So, I mean, you are very specific. Um, you're very specific in the language that you use. You talk in the video about working with these different languages that include both English, Portuguese, but also languages of design. Um, it was also something that was really important to you in developing this work with the students. So I'd just like to hear a little bit more about how you see that role of language for you and also why, where you see that for, for young artists and designers as well. Yeah, sure. Um, well, let's break it down. I'll go from like the most basic, but maybe the largest reaching answer, and then we'll go tighter. Um, so, uh, I mean, language, literally, I just don't think I can work without naming something, right? So like a lot of the times I don't feel like I'm actually working on something until I'm able to name it and sort of classify where it goes within my head and, and within my work. So like, for example, like even as I say, as you see in the video, like I have created sort of an etymology of like two distinct, but co-related parts of my practice are patterns and infinity patterns that are just almost big uh, headlines under which art can slot in, you know? And I feel like that kind of framework through language really gives me uh, a freedom, which is kind of a weird thing to say, but without that framework, I feel kind of lost. Within that framework, I feel like I can break those rules, I can connect, I can create new types of sentences by like saying like, no, I don't like using that grammar like that, I wanna use it like this. So I need this framework and for me, maybe because I've spent my life going through so many actual languages and switching back and forth, um, the language gives me that framework, right? So like, for, I'll give you one example. Like we were just talking about the negative space that's created in my patterns and then I then cut out. For a while now, I've been really drawn to those cutouts and I haven't figured out how to use them. Um, and only the other day I realized that that was because like I have no name for them, right? So I'd been thinking of them as like cast offs or like negative space or mm -hmm. cutouts. And I was like, it's too negative. It doesn't make sense. It's not like honoring the fact that like these are the things that actually make me think the most while I'm working, right? And so like just the other day, I realized that maybe they're called like ancestors, like because they're these things that sort of just show up without me expecting them to show up. And then they give me mm -hmm. sort of some knowledge and they sort of guide me forwards and then they sort of disappear, right? Because they get cut out of the project. And so now I'm like, okay, now I know what they're called. Now I have like 800 other things I want to try to do with them now that I know what these things are called. So for me, language is really important in that way. But I also, you know, want to stress that like, even though it's important to me, I want all of that to be like underneath the patterns, right? So like, that's where I talk about having a visual translation device, like the patterns should be really open. So like all this work that I put into it, it's, it's a me thing. It's for me, like for whoever's encountering it, like I want it to just work on them. Like I want them to have their own singular experience. It doesn't have to be language based. Um, for the students, I thought it was really important that we pair all of the visual work with written work in the Instagram one, because the technology allows us to do it. So we should try to take advantage of it. And I, and, and at first I didn't really understand that impulse, but now that I look back, I realize that there's something amazingly cool about being to push this idea of a quilt forward into digital space where like we've seen for millennia, for centuries, quilts that have like a community uh, that are community built and have, you know, each of the imprints of the community members that worked on it, but we don't get the sort of like behind the scenes info and we don't get their full story. And so to be able to input that almost as metadata into this quilt because it's digital is so amazing. So now looking back on it, I realize that that was a real impulse for it. But then also I think it's really important because I come from this idea of needing a framework through language to be able to use language as a feedback tool for yourself and you know artists are in an interesting position because we go to school or we are self-taught uh, to do our visual work, our artistic work, but um, we almost push being able to talk about it under the rug a lot until it becomes super important because it's the only way in which you can you know, get a residency or get awards or get shows. And so I thought it would be really, it would be really cool one, but I thought it would be really important too to already connect those two things in a way where you could see that the text is actually a tool and not something to be feared, right? 
Yeah. Just thinking, oh, sorry, Rachel. Yeah. No, no, no. All right. We'll follow up, but I was going to move on to something that's slightly different. But I was thinking is, uh, you know, one of the questions that came up in the chat um, was about what the backgrounds are behind us, mm -hmm. because we didn't really talk about kind of the bare bones of what the project was. And I was wondering if the two of you could maybe walk the audience through what it was that we developed, that you developed. Natan came up with this great idea. Um, I mean, I can talk from the apply space side, the way that our projects and programs work is we invite artists to apply with whatever they want to do. So we don't prescribe any particular project onto the artists that come here. They come up with these projects themselves. And then this project having happened in the middle of COVID was especially curious. We had no idea what was going to happen. And we had a lot of parameters we had to work around that involved not being able to be in the same room as other people, which is why we're here today. So it's a pretty interesting process. And I was wondering if you guys can kind of flesh that out a little bit. Oh, yeah. Rachel, you go first. I mean, it's your project. I I'm know, just, I I'm just helping you. I want to hear it through you, and then I'll respond. Whew. OK. All right. So this is how I see what it was. Uh, I mean, what I think was really generous and amazing was how you were willing to share your working process with the students and we had to really think, I mean, I like what Aaron's talking about that. That was one of the questions I wanted to ask was about how you see the kind of mark of COVID uh, in this, in the development of this project. Cause we knew the whole time that this was going to be the format. So, um, I mean, we're working with over a hundred students, um, four different faculty members uh, that were in, what did we say, six groups, I think, six groups, someone could correct me. But so there's a, there's a lot of different people working on this project and we were trying to think of how we could make a structure for everybody to participate in that and for everybody to have access to that. And I think that that was what was so wonderful about um, the kind of pre-recorded videos that Natan made. Uh, so basically every week there was an introduction and Natan also shared part of his process. He was kind of working alongside the students um, and then there was also feedback. So by putting all that work out on Instagram and then Natan could kind of look at that, give real-time feedback, talk to the class also in uh, through Zoom um, live. Um, I think we, from my perspective, it was what was so generous was just the way, the different ways that we're trying to use these systems and for you to share your time in trying to interact with them in different ways. Yeah, thank you. I, it's I, thank you for going first because it, it it brought up something that I wouldn't have thought about otherwise, and so I really appreciate it. Which is, you know, all of this whole conversation for this whole project first came out of just our, our discussion. I think maybe in our inter, in my interview about how like we th I thought that I how I think of digital technology is like it's a tool to be used, and like whether we use it the right way per whoever made the technology or not, like we can do something cool if we just figure out what tool allows us to do the thing we want to do. And so like, I think that's really what this project comes down to, just to break it out into super easy uh, for anybody who hasn't visited it yet. Our Patterns Muncie is at our Patterns underscore Muncie on Instagram. Uh, it's our three week collaborative quilt making uh, program online where each student uh, started with making stamps that sort of reflected their own personal uh, POV. And when I say point of view, I don't mean like what they actually see. I mean, sort of a point of view of like how you yourself understand your world, right? So um, uh, Aaron, that's misspelled, I'm sorry. Oh, I, I really, Mo Q, uh, that's, that's rough. <laughs> sorry, everybody, so, uh, it's late at night for me, apparently. So we, uh, you know, it started with that and then we, we went through two incredible, three incredible weeks of turning those stamps into these full patterns that not only brought out more of what each student was consciously thinking as an artist, but also brought in what was sort of unconsciously being processed through each student. So like, and that was a big part of what was great about the written assignments, which you can see in each Instagram post is um, students were able to talk about, you know, I was working on this and then all of a sudden I realized that like, this was how I was feeling about this current COVID situation. And so I went in this direction and it's like, it, in a lot of ways, it, it, it's just a sounding board. Like I wanted a project that was just a big sounding board that allowed us to come together as a community, even during this time when we can't physically be there, right? And that's where the idea of these final presentations in reality and the projections came out because I always wanted there to be this sort of big physical emotional core to this thing. Um, and even if you can't physically be there, you know that this thing exists in reality. Um, so that's uh, where that comes from. So I, I mean, 
I think as, as we've maybe given away now, all of our backgrounds are different patterns uh, that students made over the course of the three weeks. So you can just see how amazingly varied they are. But I think you can also see how united they are as a community. And, and that's through color. That's through concerns that you can read through the text. Um, and it's through different, you know, just through emotions. So I think it's a really healthy, diverse overview of a really cool community, you know, and I feel like um, I've been recently in the last couple of days, because I've been trying to wrap my head around this project a little bit more, I've been thinking about this as an intentional community in the way that sort of like communes were, you know, I think we all got to for three weeks really see what it's like to like intentionally participate in a larger project. And now I'm really excited to see how far down the road that reverberates. Yeah, I mean, and, you know, you talk a lot about collaboration, and I think a really important part here is, I mean, there was a lot of collaboration between, you know, the three of us in the beginning, but then also with all the students and with all the faculty. I mean, it wasn't, this wasn't prescribed to anybody. It's really the contributions of everybody uh, coming together to make this sort of collective work that um, I really liked when you described it as like, this is the real work. It's the whole, uh, the quilt, the mm -hmm. community experience. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and I want to clarify that because the whole work is that entire page, right? It's not just the quilt that you can scroll through for the first hundred posts. It's also the two, you know, it has two weeks of preparatory work on the Instagram. It has all of our videos and it also has student comments, comments back and forth between each other. So, I mean, the whole thing, the community itself is the work. Yeah, one thing I really loved watching it evolve when it started, I remember like the first three posts, we were like, ooh, there's three. And then there were six, oh, there's six, you know, and you're watching this thing grow really organically, but you have no idea what's coming next. Yeah. And so it's, it's especially interesting now to look through it and knowing that all of these images are different sets by different students, you can see this language that progresses across the whole pattern as students are developing different tools and different ideas about how to work with these patterns but then as they change from student to student you can you can kind of see it sometimes but sometimes you can't and mm -hmm. I found that really fascinating how diverse they were but they were also integrated together so it just was it was a fascinating thing for me to watch from the outside yeah let me just real quick before we go to another question let me just again thank all the students because as I told them every time I saw them on zoom I'm just was so humbled and still am by all their incredible work and everybody just gave like way more than 100% and uh, it was just amazing. So I really am so thankful. Absolutely. Well, if there's any other, oh, we got one more question from Devin, but if there's any other questions since we're getting close to seven, I just wanna throw out there, if you have any other questions in the Q and A, feel free to pop those up. If there's anything we haven't talked about that you're really interested in, we're happy to get there. Um, we don't really have a timeline, but I guess we're kind of trying, aiming for seven. Yeah. Yeah, you know, so we're not here all night. Um, so Devin would like to know a little bit more about the artists and designers that are influencing or inspiring you that sure. students uh, here at Ball State might be able to learn from or other people in the audience. Ah, well, that's a twist. So I was gonna give you a really obscure answer, but I won't do that. Uh, no, I was gonna, I'll answer it two ways. One is, um, I think I'm personally influenced a lot more by the things I just come in contact with every day than I am by like, one or two people I can name, but uh, am, I, I think we all have people in our lives that are artists and designers that influence us sort of a, a lot more than like something that I look at in a magazine, right? So like for me, my influences really start with my mom, Moema Furtado, who's been an artist and an installation artist my whole life. Um, and, you know, it's through her that I got, I think, this confidence to move between all sorts of materials and techniques and, and go from digital to real, you know. I remember there would be one year growing up where like all, one month we'd be making, you know, a hundred latex sculptures and the next month my mom would be carving a marble sculpture. So like, and then there'd be drawings and then it'd go back to painting. And, you know, uh, during the coronavirus, it went back to 40 different paintings. And then right now she sent me a photo and she's encasing gold painted uh, cow bones in wax. So Ooh. like, I really re I, you know, thank you, wow. my mom, She's so uh, good. just publicly thank you, because yeah. I think that's the key influence, you know, and I think everybody has that if they reach into it. And, you know, to keep going, you know, my father, just an amazing historian, an amazing writer. And I think, you know, if, if my love for language comes from anybody, it comes from him, and especially the way he wrote his own books, and the way he wrote 
his, um, especially his sort of like dedication pages were always way longer than they needed to be and they were beautiful. And so I think that sort of respect and care really transferred through um, for me. And, and then I'm gonna reach back one more generation and go to my grandfather on my mother's side who was the one who took the entire family to Brasilia, which without that, where would we be in my journey? And then also was an amazing artist, musician, lawyer, construction worker, farmhand, just a jack of all trades. And I think that also opened me up to be completely um, open to any possibility, right? And taking these projects wherever they can. So I wanna first encourage every single student to just look around you and see who's your real influence in life because I think that's gonna be a much stronger and much longer lasting influence than somebody that I can tell you to go on a, into a book or on a magazine and, and, and look at. And then I'll say one more artist because it's, a, it's one that's very close to me uh, which is Donald Judd. Um, and that's close to me for two reasons. I had no idea who Donald Judd was coming out of college. Uh, he, of course, had done almost all of his work, if not all of his work, before I got out of college. Uh, and then I moved to New York City, and the first job I got was at the Judd Foundation. And I, I didn't necessarily know who Donald Judd was. And again, this is props to my mom, who gave me the hot tip to apply for a job there without me knowing who what was going on. But I quickly realized how incredible Donald Judd's work was. And I think this sense of openness in an artwork, an artwork that doesn't ask you to, an artwork that doesn't ask you to tell it back to itself what it is, an artwork that just lets you sort of sit with it and have your own idea and walk away, um, an artwork that can be placemaking, but gently so. Uh, all of those ideas kind of come from my getting to live with Donald Judd's art, you know, and work with Donald Judd's art. So that'll be my one artist shout out. Awesome. Rachel, do you have any last questions? Or Natan, any last statements? Uh, uh, I just have gratitude to, to shout out to everybody. Uh, uh, Aaron, there's a really good question down here about Ply Space, if you want to talk about. Oh, yeah, let me see here. In the chat, not in the Things are coming in all kinds of windows, everybody. Oh my gosh. It's not a question so much as somebody clarifying, but maybe you can talk a little yeah. bit. So it says for the folks uh, not familiar with Ply Space, it's an artist in residence program sponsored by the Muncie Arts and Culture Council in Muncie, and uh, which is a home to Ball State University and the wonderful School of Art. Um, yeah, so Ply Space actually is in the middle of doing its uh, call for the summer's term for 2020. What's next year? 2021? I don't even know anymore. Right. So we have an open call. It closes um, on 1159 p.m. Eastern Standard Time on November 1st. So anybody watching that's interested in applying to participate in this program, you're welcome to apply. Um, the program is, we're excited about it because it's funded in part by the um, National Endowment for the Arts, who gave us this opportunity initially to create a residency that had um, like a monetary stipend for artists to come to Muncie to do work rather than asking artists to pay or asking artists to give up parts of their lives in order to do this. We really recognize being a group of artists that started the program, how important it is for artists to be compensated for the things that they do. Um, and we also really, you know, being in a small town, relatively small town in a relatively isolated place, you know, we, we have Indianapolis, we've got Fort Wayne, we've got places that are nearby, but you still have to try to get there, you know, so having um, artists come to Muncie specifically to work in the community, I think is a really special thing. So um, everybody, you know, who has been at Fly Space in the last three years since we started, um, has been super diverse and super interesting. I mean, no one has come to do the same project twice. And the thing I love the most about it is that when people apply, I have no clue what I'm going to be looking at. I mean, it is so crazy how diverse and interesting the applications are. It's, it's almost every time it's grueling to pick people because how in the world can you select between like super cool project number one and super cool project number two. So it's obviously not me that just does it, but um, we have a panel of reviewers, but it's, uh, yeah, it's been really great to have Natan here. And he's been just an exemplary uh, fellow working with Ball State. Um, we really want to thank Ball State for their support of our program. They have been endlessly supportive for the first three years. Um, and so we hope we can continue having a really great 
uh, relationship with Ball State. We also want to thank Mad Jacks and Sustainable Muncie, which is where we have our artist studios. It's been a little tricky this year because obviously with COVID, it's harder to have artists moving from building to building or you know having access to different places. But they have been uh, so flexible with us and so helpful um, to make sure that we are able to, to get our artists what we need every year. Um, so we really appreciate that. Um, and again, the, thank you to the NEA for helping keeping us afloat. So um, we really appreciate that as well. And thank you to Rachel, who has been like this wonderful carrier of the program through the School of Arts. We really, really appreciate without her. I don't think this project would have even been an inkling of what it has been. It really needed to have a person on the ground in the School of Art really caring and, and wanting to see this happen. And with Rachel and the School of Art faculty um, really made that happen happen so we really appreciate that as well and the students you know I guess but so what is this like an hour of thank yous but that's okay that's good that's um, what we want it to be you. yeah and right? I want to I want I want my you thank you, thank you too. Too. I okay. want my thank you moment but yeah. also because you know I want to I mean I want to thank the faculty I want to thank the students but I also want to just reflect on the sort of magical collaboration I mean this really exceeded really all expectations I mean I I just am so impressed by your generosity, your kindness, and your openness. I think you've really brought so much positivity um, to our classrooms and to our community. And it's just been a really fantastic time. So thanks. That's my thing. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks to everybody who's joined us tonight too. And for just Absolutely. everybody who's interacted with the project in any of its incarnations. And I, I, you know, keep, stay tuned on that Instagram page because we'll be talking about the two uh, physical manifestations of it uh, in the next coming weeks. Um, yeah, we have a, a couple things coming up still. We've got Natan, um, we'll be showing his, uh, the our patterns work will be on the side of Ply Space on first Thursday in November. Mm -hmm. So if you are in Muncie and you wanna do a drive by, we're gonna not have the gallery open, but we'll have kind of a, who knows, something in the parking lot, I guess. Um, but we'll yeah, have the, um, we're on the front of the building. We'll have the patterns being projected outside. So we thought it would be a really fun way to just kind of integrate the patterns back into the community again and think about kind of the purpose of the program to begin with. Um, so anyone who wants to drive by, it'll probably look best after dark. So that's my time for it after dark. Um, <laughs> and then we have other Ply Space and Mac projects constantly. So keep an eye on muncyarts.org and plyspace.org. Great. So thank you again for everybody for coming. Thank you, Natan and Rachel. Thank, thank you to you. all the students and all the faculty. And thank you to the attendees. We really appreciate you stopping by to uh, hear more about our project. Have a great evening and a great fr it's Friday? Friday. Storm's Friday. Happy Friday. Bye, everybody. Yeah.